welcome to the Bible study. This week we're going to be taking a departure from Hebrews, the lesson quarterly from Herald and Banner Press inserted two lessons outside of Hebrews for the Easter season. The first was on Easter itself, and then this one that we're going to be looking at today was regarding the two travelers on the road to Emmaus. So we're we'll looking at Luke chapter 24, verse 13 today. I keep notes in my Bible of people of sermons that have been preached and we're going to be pulling some material from Mark Cravens and Brian Wardlaw have preached on this passage as well as the usual materials from Wesley and Barclay. Also, please forgive a little levity here in the beginning. I've been a serious about as long as I can possibly be serious and a good friend of mine recommended to me that I get a sponsorship for the lesson. So I decided to have an opening sponsor for this week. This week's lesson is sponsored by the Ford Motor Company. Some of you will take a look here and see that the logo is a little dirty over here, and I would say that you are correct. That's not unusual because Ford trucks work. <laughs> Just a bit of fun here. There's a strong contingent of fellows in our church that are General Motors supporters, and we have a bit of fun every now and then giving each other a hard time about our selection and, and trucks. It's at this point in the story where somebody outside of our conversation would yell something, what about Dodge or something along those lines. And we would all look at him and explain to them that they didn't buy a Dodge, that they actually bought a Cummings. And they would nod their heads in acknowledgement. And if you bought a Dodge with a gas engine in it, um, I don't know what to say to you. And um, I'm sorry, but I, I can't help you. So also, most of the truck stories happen in the parking lot outside the church. You'll hear how somebody pulled three trucks uh, out of the mud this week, and you glance over at their pristine, clean truck, and suspicions arise. So I like to take people back into the sanctuary and have them repeat their story and ask for the details. And it's at that point that revival usually breaks out, and people confess their beautiful trucks have never even seen a gravel road, and they don't even own a tow strap. <laughs> Well, I hate to admit, but that experience is, is from my own life. I uh, actually did pull my brother-in-law's Dodge Diesel Cummings truck out of the mud at one of his work sites. My other brother-in-law went in after him first before I had gotten there with his Chevy and got his Chevy truck stuck as well. So we happened to be down for the weekend, and I pulled the Dodge out with my Ford Ranger 4x4 V6 Yes, yeah, serious insult to injury. My other brother-in-law refused to allow me to pull him out and made the Dodge do it that I had just pulled out. He knew he'd never hear the end of it if he allowed me to pull him out. So what I neglect to tell most people is that we had just enough tow strap for my truck to sit all four tires on an asphalt parking lot. So I had good traction when I was able to pull them out. But as far as I'm concerned, that's an inconsequential fact that doesn't, isn't really germane to the story. And no, I did not own a tow strap at that time. I miss all of you. I miss uh, the gathering of the saints, I, but not for the fun stories told in the parking lot, but for the life-changing ones that are told in the sanctuary. And that's where we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the sunset road that turned to dawn on the road to Emmaus. So we're going to start reading in Luke chapter 24 and verse 13. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus. I'm going to pause here for a minute and ask you where these gentlemen were. Now, you're going to answer, obviously, on the road to Emmaus, but more importantly to me is where they were not. They were not in church when this experience happened. We become very accustomed to our church, and we connect our church with worship. But I've been reminded during this time period that I've almost become too accustomed to it and am reminded that there are people all over this world who are worshiping in their own apartments or in their own homes because they don't have the luxury of going to a church that we normally go to. It's a luxury that they do not have. So it's interesting to note that these gentlemen had this experience with Jesus on a road while traveling, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. Picking up in verse 14, and they were talking with each other about these things which had taken place and why they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with him. Pause here as well. When did Jesus traveling start traveling with him? When they were discussing spiritual things and Jesus. Verse 16 says, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing them. So we're going to have to look ahead a little bit here to see why. But verse 19 and verse 21 tells us, why they did not see him. 
Verse 19 tells us that these people believe Jesus to be a prophet who had a good rapport with God and the people. Verse 21 tells us that they expected Jesus to be the one who came and redeemed Israel. So it's clear that they were looking for a political figure and they were something and somebody to overthrow the Roman government. But they didn't see Jesus for what he was on the spiritual kingdom that he was bringing and they did not recognize him. So picking up in verse 17, and he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they stood still looking sad. Jesus' question brought them to a halt in the middle of the road. They were talking about the things that had happened in Jerusalem, Jesus' crucifixion and death. And when Jesus asked him about it, they were almost incredulous. And they looked at him and stopped right in the middle of their traveling and looked at him. And in verse 18, one of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And Jesus said to him, What things? And they said to him, The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who is a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since all these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us, and when they were at the tomb early in the morning and they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Pausing here in verse 23, these gentlemen were not ready to accept the empty tomb as reality. They were still conveying the story as a vision that others had had. Verse 24, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as ac exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. They did not see him because they were not looking for him on where he should be. And he said to the, Jesus said to them in verse 25, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. I would have loved to have heard that exhortation on that day on the road to Emmaus, Jesus expounding on the scriptures about himself. Verse 28, and they approached the village where they were going and he acted as though he were going further, Jesus did. But they urged Jesus saying, stay with us for it is getting towards evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them, and when he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. So why did they now recognize Jesus would be the question. Well, I think the scripture here gives us two reasons. One, Jesus had just expounded on who he was. These two men now knew who Jesus was, that he was not just merely a prophet, but he was the Messiah. And secondly, they had seen Jesus break bread before, and there was something about that ritual of him giving thanks to his father that stirred their hearts and made them see something they had not been able to see that was standing right in front of them. Verse 32 said, they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And he got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the 11 and those who were with him, saying, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. And they begin to relate their experience on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of bread. Barclay calls this another of the immortal short stories of the word. I'm going to cover a few points or a series of points in looking at this story. The first is that the story tells of two people who were walking towards the sunset. From the very beginning of the history of the nation of Israel, going back to them leaving Egypt and walking in the desert, Numbers 21 says that the people who follow God should walk towards the sunrise and not towards the sunset. These people were walking away from Jerusalem. They were walking in the wrong direction. And it took Jesus meeting them on the road to get them turned around. Repentance is a 180 degree turn. And you notice at the very end of this story, these people got up right where they were on the road to Emmaus and turned around and walked back to Jerusalem, to the east, to the rising sun. 
Point two, this story tells us of the ability of Jesus to make sense of things. These people had put all of their hopes, dreams, goals, desires, and ambitions in Jesus. And they had seen all of those hopes, dreams, and ambitions crucified on a cross and sealed in a tomb. And they could not make sense of any of that. But now Jesus came to them, walked with them on the road from one city to another and expounded and explained it all. And what they could not understand when Jesus explained now perfect sense. And he asked them, did you not know that the Christ had to suffer before he could enter his glory? We are in a, a time of confusion. It's hard to explain why we're going through what we're going through. But let's seek Jesus for the explanation because he's the one that can make sense of things that don't make sense. Third, it tells us of the courtesy of Jesus. You have a gift. It's called free will. And you can make any choice you want on this, on this planet Earth. These men were traveling with Jesus and Jesus was telling them stories and Jesus made to go on and leave them behind. But they asked Jesus to stay. And it made all the difference for them. Because when they asked him to stay and he broke bread, they saw who he was. Your free will. You can use it to invite Christ to enter into your life, or you can allow it, use it to allow Christ to move on. And the choice is yours. But I ask you today to use it as the men on the road to Emmaus used it and invite him in. Fourthly, it tells us how he was known to them at the breaking of bread. I want to be clear here that we're not talking about the breaking of bread as a sacrament. We're talking about an ordinary meal in an ordinary house with an ordinary loaf of bread. Nothing special. And it was then, in that ordinary circumstance, that Jesus was recognized. It has been suggested, some would say, that these men may have been there when Jesus broke the bread and performed the miracle at the feeding of the 5,000, and he may have done something similar here. But whatever you want to believe or however you think along those things, clearly there was a ritual that Jesus had about breaking bread and giving thanks to his Father. And we begin to understand that it is not only at the communion table that we are with Christ, but we are with him at the dinner table as well. He is not only the host of the church, his church, but he can be the host of your home, your ordinary home. And that's what we're asking for now. We've been outside the congregation and the formal church house for a long time. But Jesus wants to break bread in your house. He's the Lord of the communion table, and he can be Lord of your dinner table as well. Fifthly, it tells two people of who, when they receive such great joy, they hasten to share it. It was a seven-mile journey back to Jerusalem. They didn't wait. It was late in the evening until the next day when they were rested. But they got up and left immediately. The Christian message is never truly ours until we share it with somebody else. Sixth, the story tells us that when they reached Jerusalem, they found others who had already shared their experience. It's the glory of the Christian life to be able to gather together with a fellowship of the saints and share your stories. And that's what happened there back in Jerusalem. Lastly, I would say that it tells us of the compassion of Christ that he appeared to Peter. Peter's story has tragedy in it and at Christ ending and he struggles towards the end. But it is Jesus who seeks out Peter and has a conversation with him. And I think it's one of the great points of this story that Jesus went and appeared to Peter. So looking back at this story, we can say that the experiences of these two disciples is a paradigm for the experience of many subsequent Christians. They're discussing the significance of the reports of Jesus' resurrection. And according to their summary, they knew that Jesus was a prophet who was killed by the priests. But they regard the reports of an empty tomb as a vision. I want to tell you that Jesus' resurrection is more than a report of a vision. The resurrection becomes a reality to these disciples through two experiences. One, it was the Christ-centered interpretation of all the scriptures, Jesus expounding on the word of God. And secondly, it was the breaking of the bread. So this story tells us how Jesus Christ is going to be known to the world. One, it's you expounding the scripture, starting with Moses and going all the way through and explaining the story of the Messiah. 
But secondly, it's you doing that at your dinner table in ordinary circumstances. And that's how the message of Jesus Christ will be spread. My road, to, and at the end of that, when you look at it, when those two things are accomplished, it's the church where we go to expound on what has happened at our own dinner tables. So my wish for you is that you have an Emmaus Road experience in your own home. And when you come back to church, you tell us what it was like to meet with the Lord while you were away. Verses 33 and 35, 33 through 35, tell us what church is supposed to look like. And when they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, they found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and appeared to Simon. And they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he recognized them in the breaking of bread. Church is where you go to tell your heart-burning experiences that you had while out on the road. Can you imagine sitting in that room and hearing the stories of how the Lord met with Simon, Peter, and Luke, and John, and James, and all the rest? But it wasn't just them that got to share their stories. Cleopas got to share his story as well. Can you imagine the strength in your Christianity that you would have when you would leave that place on that day? How much hope you would have that Christ is working in all the lives of those around you? And that's what church is supposed to be, friends. You are not supposed to come back to church to worship God. You are supposed to come back to church and tell uh, all of us how you have been worshiping God, how your heart burned within you in your backyard, and how you expounded the scriptures and shared the word of the Lord at your own dinner table. Right now we're on the road. We're locked out of the church because of a stay-at-home order because of coronavirus. But I'm looking forward to getting back together and hearing the stories of my fellow believers in Christ to come back and tell us how the Lord met with you while you were seven miles or 10 miles or 50 miles away from church. I'm looking forward to that celebration of how we've been worshiping Christ and how he met with all of us, even though we weren't in his holy sanctuary. I'm looking forward to being back to church and seeing all of you. And I'm looking forward to the stories how God richly blessed us all on our way back. May the Lord richly bless you.